This recording was made as part of the oral history project by St. Joseph's College program student in spring 2017 semester. It was recorded on April 12, 2017 at 10 a.m. in the Sisters of St. Joseph's Convent located at 232 Clinton Avenue, Brooklyn, New York. The interviewers are Jessemini Fernandez, Kyla Caravella, and Lupna Vato. The interviewer is Sister Elizabeth Hill. So let's start with the, uh, one of the first question. So, would you describe the most important moment of you personally during your time at St. Joseph's College, or the most important change brought to St. Joseph's College? Well, those are, those are two different questions. So I'm going to take mm -hmm. the first one because that's the one I, I thought about. And for me personally, uh, I really have to be honest and say the most important moment was when I was inaugurated as the president. <laughs> um, it was a very exciting day for me, and it was, I think, an exciting day for the college. Uh, we had the event up at the Brooklyn Museum, and we had 450 guests, and it was a kind of a splendid time with um, guests from other colleges, from the bishop was there, and it was just sort of a very wonderful day to celebrate the history of the college and my own um, relationship to the college. Uh, my mother is a graduate, was a graduate of St. Joseph's College. She was in the second class. I'm a graduate of St. Joseph's College, so I have deep roots here. So to become the president was very meaningful to me and very special. And uh, so that particular day stands out in my mind as uh, kind of uh, one of those golden days that, you're, that you look back and, and remember with great, great happiness. Uh, as far as the changes are concerned, um, I think the biggest change that I would look at would be technology. Um, it has just obviously taken over the world, and St. Joseph's is no different. And I remember going back um, many, many years ago, probably close to 30 years ago, when we began to do little tentative steps, take little tentative steps toward figuring out what we could do, what we should do. And you know, obviously, once you get into that momentum, it builds and it builds, and then you realize you have no choice, you can't go back. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've always admired the um, staff for their resilience, actually, because I remember distinctly, uh, we went to several other colleges, uh, we had people in the administration, um, and we went to other colleges, and we talked to people, and we got advice, and we came back, and we made a decision. We got this company, CMDS, and they came, and they kind of like brought in boxes plunked a computer on people's desks and said, good luck. And we just expected people to continue to do their work, to the registrar to get the you know, courses scheduled and to get the exam scheduled and to get transcripts out. And the, you know, the transcript, I mean, the financial people to send out the bills and pay the bills. And, and at the same time, we're saying, now you have to learn this other thing and hurry up and do it. And to my amazement, they did it with such grace and with such uh, you know, genuine dedication to the mission of the college. So that was also a very meaningful time, but also one that I think just changed the college. I don't think we've ever really given up our commitment to the liberal arts, and I hope we never do. But I think having integrated technology into virtually every aspect of the college uh, enables us to be competitive, mm -hmm. enables us to attract students, enables us to really prepare students to enter into the world of work, whatever field you're going into, whether it's business or education or nursing or even the fine arts, you need to have technology at your fingertips and to know. So those are the things that I think, uh, that was the big, big thing I think that um, changed the college and yet didn't change it, which is good. Um, one question, kind of going back to what you said as the first, like the most important moment about your being president, what was like that like, like being president of the whole college and like how, what was like some of the greatest parts or hardest parts of that for you? On the whole, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and it was fun because I was working with wonderful people. Um, you know, if, if you're uh, focused on a mission, a common mission, which we were, uh, which was to bring the very best, highest quality academic experience to our students with the other uh, elements in terms of extracurricular and co-curricular experiences that we possibly could afford. Uh, and if you're all about that, um, and you're all coming at it from your different 
areas of expertise. So you have your financial people thinking about it, you've got your development people thinking about it, everybody's thinking about it. And then you come together and you put the ideas on the table and everybody you know, jostles about and you come up with a good idea, a better one than anyone had. Um, it's very energizing, it's very exciting, and it really enables you to move things forward and to make changes happen. Uh, my predecessor, Sister George Aquin, had made huge changes at the college. I didn't have to make as many huge changes as she did. As I said, in my day, the technology was the huge thing. But when she really um, decided to go out to Patchogue, when she decided to go co-ed, which was a big thing, that uh, frankly, a number of the alumni were not happy about back in 1970. They were thinking, well, St. Justice College for Women is my school. I don't want the, those, those guys to be there. But they came. Um, and you know, in many ways, she really changed the, the, the school so much for the better. Uh, gave it strength financially, gave it strength academically. Um, so I think that we, what we did was really to build on that. We introduced a number of new programs. We strengthened the graduate programs. Uh, I think our reputation grew and grew. Uh, we were recognized by US News and World Report and then by Forbes year after year as being one of the best colleges uh, in, our, in our category. Uh, you know, we're not in the Harvard category, obviously, but uh, in our, with, with our competitors and our, our, our colleagues. And I always thought that was really an important thing um, because it, it showed the faculty that their work was, was valuable and valued. And it showed parents that their children, you people, uh, would really be getting the very best possible education and experience that uh, a college could hope to give. And so I think those are the things that I look back on. One of the things that was very near and dear to me, because I love the arts, I love the opera, I love the ballet, I love the Philharmonic, I love all of those things. And I felt it's very important that our students know about them. You know, a lot of people hate the ballet. Well, at least know enough about it that you can know why you hate it. And the same thing with the opera. Okay, it's too long and it's loud. But I mean, it's also very beautiful if you love it, as I do. So we tried to bring through the Council for the Arts, which I created, um, different art experiences onto the campus because quite frankly, going to the opera is prohibitively expensive. Mm -hmm. And so other, other experiences, even going to the theater in New York City is very, very uh, costly. So we tried to really create an environment in which the students would at least be exposed to different art forms and decide, I like this one, I don't like that one so much, you know, that kind of thing. So those are the things that we try to enhance the, the cultural life, uh, bring technology, and then create basically an environment. Of course, uh, when we went NCAA uh, for the athletic programs, we also made a commitment there to uh, increase our, uh, well, our commitments and the, the support that we we're going to give to athletic programs. Because although I was never an athlete for obvious reasons, um, I really believe that's an important thing for school spirit and for the athletes to have the chance to compete and to succeed. So those are kinds of some of the big things that I think uh, were important and hopefully uh, successful and, and helpful. Um, I know you also said your many colleagues that you got to work with made it like so, so, so great of an experience. Like who would you say maybe had the greatest impact on you as of, during your time at SJC? Well, I'd have to single out probably three people. Uh, Sister George, to whom I referred earlier, she was my boss. Uh, for 17 years, I was her assistant before I became the president. And she just basically taught me everything I know. Um, she was a visionary woman. She was a courageous woman. Uh, she was a determined woman. And when she took office in 1969, the college was in trouble. And a number of small Catholic women's colleges were going out of business. And Sister George was determined that was not going to happen to St. Joseph's College. So as I said earlier, she did a number of things. She introduced things. Some were controversial. She had to fight through opposition from the alums. She had to fight through opposition from um, some faculty about different academic programs. She just kept going, and she made it all happen. Uh, the second person I would single out would be um, Sister Mary Florence Burns, who was another mentor of mine, uh, who has been a lifelong friend, whose wisdom and uh, insight have been just invaluable to me. To this day, I still go to her and say, Florence, what do you think about this? And she'll tell me what she thinks. Uh, she's also a very freeing person. She never tells you what she thinks and then thinks you're going to have to go do it. She shares her 
experience, her wisdom, and then let you go and make your own decision. Uh, sometimes you'll live to regret your decision, but that's okay too. You learn from that. And the third person would be Sister Loretta McGrand, who uh, you may not know because uh, she retired uh, as from the position of provost uh, three years ago, probably before any of you showed up. And she was, for many years, based out in Patchogue as the dean of that campus. But Sister Loretta and I are, uh, been, we've been friends ever since we entered the convent together. We entered the same day. So we've been very dear friends. So she and I, because I had the administrative perspective, and that was always about how much is this going to cost. And she had the administrative uh, academic uh, perspective, which always was, we have to do this for the students. So we often would have little arguments, but they never, they never touched our friendship. So uh, she is another one who has been uh, critical and pivotal to my experience here at St. Joseph's and, and who added a great deal to the joy of the job. Um, you also spoke just at the end about the financial outlook on things and how much this is going to cost. And one of our next questions was actually about like, what do you think about the influence, what do you think influenced the increase in tuition from the 90s, maybe when you started working here as an assistant or as president until now? Well, the first thing I would blame <laughs> is technology. Because I used to describe technology as a big black hole into which you just kept pouring money. Uh, because you had to have what you needed to have. And of course, as you know, everything becomes obsolete the minute you buy it. And so that became a huge cost factor in our budget. Uh, we recognized that we needed to do that. The second thing, and I don't mean to, uh, to blame them, but I decided when I became president that we were going to strengthen the faculty. And by that I meant I wanted to have more faculty with the terminal degree the doctorate, or whatever is the appropriate degree in the discipline. Well, of course, if people have gone through all the trouble of getting a PhD, they don't come for a salary as low as somebody who has a bachelor's or a master's. Well, we don't, we don't hire people with only bachelors. So that was a different, a different perspective and a new challenge and a new cost. Running two campuses, of course, is very costly because we have to really replicate uh, many functions we have to have two admissions offices, two registrar's offices, two of this and two of that. And just managing the plant alone is very costly. And then the fourth thing that I think, uh, looking back, became a, a significant uh, cost factor was the increased focus on athletics. Because as you add teams, we, you add costs, transportation costs, getting teams to games and getting them hopefully into uh, maybe post-season tournaments, which is always uh, a desire, you know, that's what you want to have happen. Uh, so I'd, I'd say those are the four major areas that really forced us to continue. And, you know, the other regular operational things, of course, the library, Naomi, right? Uh, we always wanted to have the library as up uh, to speed as possible. Um, faculty are encouraged to continue to add to the collection. So it, it was just basically a whole concatenation of events and things that sort of came together. We're not unique in having to raise tuition on an annual basis. That is, unfortunately, uh, the, the reality for most colleges like St. Joseph's. Uh, in fact, this afternoon I have a meeting with a number of the college presidents because I have this new job now. Uh, I'm working with a consortium of Catholic colleges, and today the presidents are meeting, and they all acknowledge that it's unfortunate, but they have no choice. They have to keep on uh, passing on some of these costs to the consumer, which happens to be I'm sorry to say, you <laughs> folks. So that's, that's my best answer to that one. Um, as a follow-up to that question, since technology definitely has brought um, a lot of uh, students to pay a certain amount of tuition, um, do you think that there are certain changes or improvements that SJC needs at the moment to meet the growing student population and to meet the students' needs? You know, I, I'm in somewhat uh, at a disadvantage in answering that because it has been three years since I've been operating in the you know, day-to-day -day work of the college. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. Uh, I can only assume that the answer would be yes, uh, because as I said earlier, technology is a never-ending, uh, it, it's kind of like you know, it has this, this voracious appetite that just keep, keeps wanting more and more. Uh, I think as they've introduced, for instance, the hospitality and tourism management um, major, 
I would assume that that has also created both new opportunities but also new cost factors in terms of uh, the way that people have to be um, you know, brought in as experts. Uh, I think that in that particular field, as well as in the journalism field, that you're really dealing with people who uh, are very successful out there in the real world. But they, you know, they, they come to the college, I'm sure, expecting to be remunerated at a level commensurate with their mm -hmm. experience and with their, their success. So that's really the best answer I can give you. I'm sorry, I, I don't really know. Uh, just, but you know, tapping back into my own experience, I just know that every year uh, there was need, and every year we tried to meet it, and I'm sure that has been true uh, these last three years, and I hope and pray that it will be true forever because that's the reason that the school exists for the students. You know, that's the only point we get up in the morning and we go to work is to provide the best possible educational and, and living environment for our students. And so if we're not doing that, we should, we should shut down. Um, so for example, um, uh, the bachelor's in nursing program has recently been uh, started. And uh, do you think there are any additional programs that or any facilities that we should uh, incorporate to our um, SJC campus or anything like um, new buildings maybe adding on since the population of SJC is definitely growing day by day every year you would see new students from all diversity um, well I think the um, the nursing when you mentioned nursing uh, it's very uh, clear that right now they're building new nurse program but when we introduced the four-year program we had to commit to in adding significantly to the office space for the nurses and also for the nursing faculty and also uh, significantly add nursing labs. Um, so I know that's happening now. And I know that there have been some adjustments in the library, uh, both here and some adjustments out in Padjog to accommodate these new labs. Uh, they are very fascinating. They're, they're sim labs, simulation labs. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know if you've seen them in an operation, but they really are amazing, where a nursing student can be kind of like in the OR and a crisis will happen and then they'll be expected to respond. And obviously, I saw one student one time up at another college up at, in Vermont. And the poor student, it was a, a baby had been born and the baby was in distress. So the nursing student got all involved in the baby. Meanwhile, the mother was in worse distress. But the nursing student completely ignored the mother because she was so cap captured by the baby. So fortunately, it was not a real mother or a real baby. Uh, so when she got the baby settled, she done, the mother was really in very bad shape by that time. And I admire, the nursing instructor let this happen uh, so that the, the, the nursing student could realize how this could have been a tragedy. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't, obviously. Um, so that's a very important thing happening. Uh, I know that uh, you know, the journalism students uh, need different kinds of facilities, and I, I'm sure that they're striving as best they can to accommodate those. One of the things that is true at both campuses is the, the lack of space. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know really, we did on many occasions try to figure out ways in which we could expand this campus. But as you know, we're in a very dense residential area and there just isn't a lot of place to go. Uh, we were very fortunate to be able to build the new gym, uh, but we had to sacrifice the parking uh, even though we have parking below, it's not quite as much as we used to have. So for us here in Brooklyn, space is a major problem. We can't build up much higher because of the zoning re regulations. Uh, we can't build out because we can't, there's no land to build on. Um, and I don't really know exactly right now, other than perhaps trying to find some places for uh, a living facilities for students who might be interested in boarding, whether there's a need specifically for additional academic buildings. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know that. I, I'm not aware of it. That wasn't the factor when I left, but it could be now. Things change fast. So there has been many students that after gra graduate, they keep contributing um, to the St. Joseph's College community. So according to the alumni grant, there there was a strong alumni presence in the 1930s, such as the Alumni Week program. Do you think the alumni relations have remained strong today? Oh yes, they have. Um, 
I don't know about the 1930s. I wasn't here then. But um, I do know, as I said, my mother graduated from St. Joseph's in 1921. And she was a loyal alumna until the day she died. I mean, she loved the college, and her, her classmates loved the college. And they were all, you know, benefactors, as we, as we use the term. Uh, that is, they gave money. And they gave time, and they gave, my mother was a volunteer down here uh, during the 1960s. And so uh, in many ways, the alumni have been uh, very loyal and very faithful. Um, I think we have a very good uh, development office right now. And one of their major focuses is to uh, continue to reach out to alumni. And one of the ways they're trying to do that is by reaching out to students so that when you're going through the undergraduate experience, that you really identify with yourself, not just as a student, but as a lifelong member of the St. Joseph's College community. And so if you look at the annual report, you will see there are pages and pages and pages of names of alumni who have given to the college within the range of their capacity. Some can give very major gifts, and that's wonderful. Most cannot, because so many of our alums go into fields of, uh, of service such as teaching and nursing and social work that don't really have the high uh, you know, salary and bonuses that you might find if you had a whole bunch of people on Wall Street. Uh, nonetheless, there is that, that willingness to pass on what they received here because there is a sense of gratitude that they got such a good education. Uh, my own classmates, for instance, established a scholarship uh, when we were approaching our uh, golden Jubilee. Can't even imagine we were a courtship, but we did, and we got past it actually. So, um, and one of my classmates, uh, who's a very successful uh, professor of history out at University of California uh, in LA, uh, internationally recognized, said, "You know, we really were so well prepared to go on for graduate work and in any in any field. She was history, but we had PhDs in chemistry, and was a small school. Yeah, uh, we should really pay back." So they established the scholarship, and it's now generating a, the equivalent of a full scholarship for a student every year. And so other, co other classes have, uh, are now po copying that. So class of 69 has a scholarship, and, and we're encouraging each class as they get to a certain, you know, you have to wait till people get to a point in their own personal lives where, in many cases, their own kids are on their own or, or grown, and they don't have the big tuition bills that they're paying. To, but at that point, then, you can say to them, well, would you consider? And many of them say, absolutely, because I'm so grateful for the education that I received and for what it enabled me to do and what it's enabled me to do for my children. So let me help the next generation. Uh, as you know, many of our students are, I don't know how many of you are first generation here uh, in this country. But resources are limited for many of our students. And so it's very important that we keep, keep the faculty, to keep, the, keep the alumni uh, involved and um, sensitive to these needs and to the possibility that they can make a difference in a student's life. Mm -hmm. So I, I also, the mentoring program is very important now. That's the second thing. It's not just money, but in many cases, it's time. They're giving time to work with the student uh, to really help them, direct them, guide them, give them some insight into what it would be like to be a lawyer or somebody on Wall Street or a, a, phys a physician or something like that. So that's a very important part of it, too. Um, I know you spoke about um, like the change from uh, all women's college to co-ed and how a lot of the alumni, like you were just speaking about, were like not happy. on board with it. Really. Not happy. No. Um, <laughs> um, but we were talking about World War II and how it was just a significant event in world history, of course, overall. And thinking, how do you think, what thoughts you might have on how that affected the women and men and how that um, kind of coincided with the change of co-ed and how that affected the role of women at SJC as a whole? I, I, I have to ask you, why did you focus on World War II? Um, honestly, I know you're all history people, right? So this is no, this. I, someone like thought that was a question and I know the last interview had a little, it was like a little off too because the sister was like, I wasn't around in World War II. But we were just, someone kind of just saw that as like a big event um, in history and just really like wanted to know like what, not that you were there, but what you might have thought, how that could have affected the college. You know, I, I, I can only imagine, but I think uh, as, as, you know, 
I know service has always been a very important thing at St. Joseph's College. So I would imagine that the students at that point probably got involved in Red Cross efforts or uh, different kinds of volunteerism, but I honestly don't know. I mean, I do know a lot more about the Vietnam War because okay. I lived through that. Uh, and I think that had a, a major, major impact. I mean, up until the 60s, as you know, you know, Catholic education was a fairly, uh, it, it flowed sort of evenly. It was like a, a kind of quiet little river that just went kind of flowing down gently from the source to the end. Uh, the Vietnam War brought tremendous dissension and uh, disruption to virtually every campus in the country, uh, including Catholic colleges. And so my own classmates now, I, I graduated before the, the peak of the rebellions, which happened in 1968. I graduated in 64. But we were very aware of the fact that we were in the middle of this war. And so we were down on uh, Court Street and you know, picketing and doing things like that. I think there was a much heightened awareness of international relations, of the role of the United States in the world, of whether this was uh, in any way a war that we should be involved in. And most of us felt no. Um, so I think that was really the beginning of uh, an environment which was much more maybe questioning, uh, much more challenging, uh, maybe healthier. Um, you know, tr really trying to figure out how do we as uh, well, as Catholics, as women, uh, fit into this, this new social structure where there is so much turmoil and there, there is so much confusion. I mean, you know, people going to Canada, people being killed, you know, day by day you were, you were seeing uh, the scenes coming from the war. And of course, another thing that we had in the Vietnam War they didn't have in the Second World War was instant replay. We could see what was happening over there because you had your photojournalists who would write on the spot filming things. In the Second World War, they got it third and fourth hand. They, they had newsreels that they might see on a Saturday if they went to a movie. But it was much, much, uh, if I can use the word, neater and tidier. They didn't really see the reality. So I think that the patriotism that permeated the country in the Second World War, everybody was on board. Everybody was sacrificing. You had your liberty gardens where people were growing their own vegetables, and you had people not driving their cars because they were saving a fuel for the, for the army. All of these things, uh, you know, war bonds were being bought by everybody, no matter how wealthy they were. None of that in the Vietnam War, because there was, the country was just really torn apart. So that, that to me, began to really affect all women, uh, you know, and, and certainly the women here at St. Joseph's College. Uh, at that time. Um, adding on to that question, I remember uh, I was here myself in 2000, uh, when, 2001 when uh, the 9-11 oh. attack happened. I know that was a very hard time for everyone, um, and especially as a, as a Catholic tradition that we have here, and we respect all religions and all ethnicities. Do you think uh, there was a certain kind of fear in that period of time, or how was there a, was there a support system where everyone was um, united and uh, you know uh, there were possible I guess kind of programs or anything offered or any kind of meetings offered to just come together and um, discuss this matter? Well, we certainly had many gatherings uh, as a result of it. Some to do exactly what you just said, just to kind of be together as a community, to pray together, to support each other. Uh, it was a shattered time. I mean, I, I, nobody who has lived through it will ever forget that day. You know, you know exactly where you were, what you were doing, with whom you were speaking when you heard about the first plane, and then when you heard about the second plane, and you knew, then you knew. Um, I think the college pulled together beautifully. Uh, we did not have then as many Muslim students as we have now, um, but we had a few, and I think we reached out immediately. Uh, students reached out to their friends, and faculty and administration reached out to assure them that we didn't blame them, we didn't equate them with what had happened, uh, that we understood that they were as dismayed and as heartbroken as we were, and so 
I think it was, uh, you know, certainly a heartbreaking time. We, we lost several uh, recent graduates of the college, um, and so we had a ceremony, you know, to memorialize them over uh, near St. Angela Hall. And um, we had a number of different things. I remember speaking at a number of different things, always with that effort to reach out and just be reconciling. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph, who have been part of this college for its entire history of 100 years, um, our, our kind of mission is to be instruments of uh, unifying love and reconciliation. So it was very important to us, as the leaders of the institution, that we create that environment, that we immediately cut off any blame games or uh, harsh you know, retaliation or anything like that. Or, and I, I think, I, I hope, you know, you never know what's really going on in somebody else's heart, mm -hmm. but I hope that we were somewhat successful in um, embracing uh, the community in a way that enabled us to go forward together. Uh, and I think the fact that we've had a number of uh, young Muslim women come uh, is, to me, a sign that we've been successful in doing that, that they do feel at home here, which is important. Also, as, um, as a ACES student myself, I'd like to know um, what inspired the founding of the ACES program and how did this affect promoting diversity on campus and the student admissions process? Well, you could probably talk about that better than I can because you're there. Are you also, Jesse? Yes. And an ACES student, yes. And, and yeah. an ACES student. Uh, that really began as a combination of our desire to diversify the population, precisely, and to increase our student body. And we realized that there were a number of very bright, gifted young men and women out there who would prosper in a place like St. Joseph's, which is small, student-centered, and would provide them with the kinds of uh, opportunity and um, backup that would enable them to, to succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have to credit Sister Margaret Buckley uh, with having the idea. Uh, she didn't name it ACES. One of the um, alumni named it ACES because we had a little ad hoc committee of uh, women who had been very successful in the public school system. They were superintendents or principals. So we brought them together and said, how would you do this if you were doing it? And so they gave us some suggestions and we kind of used most of them. And one of the suggestions was to call it the ACES program. So you would all think that you were ACES, uh, which is a, a good thing to be. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really, it, it was a very simple uh, effort. Uh, it started small. And then we were fortunate enough to have a benefactor, uh, Dick Dunn from California, and his wife, uh, Mary Grace Calhoun Dunn, uh, had died very suddenly and very recently, and he was bereft, really. Um, so I, I knew that he wanted to do something to remember he, her here at her alma mater. So I went to him with the suggestion that he might endow or at least give the startup funds for this program. And he loved the idea. Um, so that's really how, that's how we, we put together the idea, which came from uh, a whole bunch of people. Mm -hmm. And we got the, the startup uh, funds. And then, of course, since then, uh, we've been continuing to try to support it through fundraising and uh, you know, just keeping it going. Mm -hmm. How many are in it now? Um, oh, well. Um from my class, uh, the freshman class, I know there's about um, 100 to 150. Um, it's in, increased. In and ACES? Yeah, in ACES. Wow, that's great. Like every year they grow um, each year. So the population, I was mentioning, there's a lot of diversity on campus. Oh, yes. Yeah, and that definitely has brought new um, cultural events as well on campus. So, Good. yeah. Good. We led the class together of 100. Yeah, and it's, um, yeah, it, I'm not too sure about the exact number, but it definitely does increase every year. I talked to one of the ACES advisors and they did mention that. Good, yeah. good, that's a good, that's a good. Yeah, it's like, but, um, I mean, I believe it's like maybe like 20 to 30 students per semester. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, maybe that's, that was probably your class. Um, for, for us, there's been, um, increase in our freshman year 2020 class, uh, but uh, that 
Well, it doesn't matter. Because <laughs> yeah. It's growing. The important thing is that yeah. it continues yeah, to grow. Exactly. That's, good. <laughs> yes. That's good. That's Definitely. good. Definitely. Um, okay, so let's change the things. Okay, so um, you have mentioned being um, your role as a Catholic um, person in the college. Um, so what were some of your reasons for choosing to become a sister? How do you feel about the diminishing numbers of nuns in the college? Oh, well, this, this question, why did you become a nun? <laughs> um, uh, I always say to people, okay, why did you marry your husband? <laughs> <laughs> I, I rest it there. I mean, it's, it's, it seems the right thing to do. It makes me happy. Uh, I found great joy in it. Um, what my motives were when I was 22, I don't know. I finished college and I got my master's before I entered the convent, so I was a little bit older than some of the people. Um, but it just seemed to be the right thing, something I, I admired the sisters with whom I had been uh, blessed to uh, have here as teachers at St. Joseph's, so it was really, I think, just a sense of, um, I wanted to serve, I wanted to have that kind of life. Um, uh, the diminishment of the, you know, the different religious congregations is, of course, a sad thing for us. I mean, obviously, we would love to have more young women entering so we could see that the things that we have valued and have tried to, uh, to, to create and to bring forth and, and to share uh, with others will continue, but it doesn't seem to be happening. So I think what we just simply have to say is it's all God's work. You know, I, I say to people, if God wanted, um, Convents to be filled, they would be. So I think that God has a plan. And I think his plans include much more involvement of lay people in the life of the church. And I think Pope Francis is very much attuned to that, where he's reaching out and embracing a greater uh, diversity of, of people, and possibly even the idea of having um, you know, married priests, uh, breaking open some of the old uh, norms and, and seeing some more flexibility. So we don't know what the future is going to bring, but we just feel, you know, we're doing our best to live faithfully day by day and let God's will be done. Oh, sorry. Hold um, on one second. Sorry about that. I just saw just one second. <laughs> okay. Technology issues. Yes, technology. <laughs> Well, it's getting grayer out there. Watch yeah. it. I'm looking. Yeah. Everything. I'm looking at the skies. Yeah, yeah the flowers are coming up. Spring, spring is my favorite season. Mm -hmm. I'm summer too. Spring summer. has gotten shorter and shorter though. Yeah. They seem to be getting. You know, we winter lasts longer, and then the summer comes, and we yeah. go right. Spring and fall. I love both of them, but I feel each one is like two weeks. They're so. disappearing. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, that's why I find it so amazing that people really deny climate change because obviously something's happening mm -hmm. <laughs> that's quite major and uh, uh, yeah that was one of my questions that I wanted to ask after this program, <laughs> as one of the things that I'm really concerned about is what we should do you know as uh, the new generation and we have I think we have all the resources and we should definitely be uh, doing something uh, I know that we recently had um, speaker come in, Caitlin Chatterley, mm -hmm. and she spoke about uh, GMO foods and how they're harming the planet. Mm -hmm. And that really got me thinking of, you know, what we do in our daily lives and how that can impact us in the future as well yeah. and our future generations. So, Well, it's good to think about it, and then it's good to act on it as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, when we built the Hill Center, we really went for LEAVES certification, and that was important because we wanted to both do the right thing, and also make a statement that we were concerned about it, you know. Um, so that, that, and there's, I, you know, obviously we all make choices every day about how we use fossil fuels. I mean, I know my carbon footprint is probably shocking because I drive a great deal. For this job I have, I have to, like I said, I don't have to drive out to Malloy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yesterday I was out in Brentwood. I mean, I'll be, you know, on the road, I'm on the road a lot. And are we all right? One second. 
Uh, actually, we might have to continue with just the sound, if that is okay. That would be fine. Okay. I never like having my picture taken. <laughs> still going so if you could right. sorry right. about the interruption that's okay um so it, this will be recording but this camera unfortunately memory is full so oh okay yes i talked too much in <laughs> no it's okay mm -hmm. no um so the just the sound okay, okay. all right um, I know you were speaking about like being a sister and like all that like your decision and all that went into that and I was just wondering like I know it's the sisters of St. Joseph so is that specific to the college or is it like a separate like how does that become like do you have to like go here and teach her or am I just a little bit off hitting? <laughs> okay uh, there are many 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 different orders in the church sisters of St. Joseph are one there's the Dominicans there's the sisters of mercy all, I mean, gazillions. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph are an, an international community. We're all over the world. We're in Africa, India, Asia, South America, here, whatever, mm -hmm. Canada. Uh, but we all go back to one little town in France called Le Puy, L-E-P-U-Y. And there we were founded in 1650 by a, uh, a group of six very simple French women who wanted to live together, pray together, and serve. That was their serve God, serve their friend, their, their, their fellow uh, people. So that's where it all started and grew from there. And as each uh, group got large enough, uh, a bishop in an adjacent diocese would say, well, would some of you come over and work in my place? So it went from Le Puy to Annecy to Clermont to Chambéry, all over France. During the French Revolution, the, uh, all religious orders were suppressed, and we actually had six of our sisters go to the guillotine. Uh, so the others all went, they scattered home, back, scattered went back to their homes. And then back in 1806, uh, the Bishop of Lyon asked Mother Fanfan, I don't know if you've heard of Fanfan Hall, Mother Fanfan, to reestablish the order. So she did, and in 1836, um, the Bishop of St. Louis in Missouri asked Sisters of St. Joseph to come to America. So six Sisters of St. Joseph came to America and they were in St. Louis and they taught children who were deaf. There probably was a measles epidemic or something like that, that so they had this whole problem with children who were deaf. And then from there, we spread all over the United States. So there are literally thousands of us all over the world. I belong to the Sisters of St. Joseph of Brentwood because as each individual, each new place was established, it kind of became independent of the others. So here we have, for instance, we have Boston, we have Erie, Pennsylvania, we have Philadelphia, we have um, Brentwood, each one a separate entity. And then, but we do get together, but we have this, the common history and the common traditions and the common purpose. That's a long-winded way of saying how we got here. Okay. And um, also going back to uh, when we were talking about uh, maintaining the Catholic values, what are some of the challenges uh, or barriers that uh, you think that we face in um, the future of maintaining our Catholic values and the traditions that we have? Well, I think, you know, obviously the world is filled with um, contradictions, and I, I think that most of our students come from families where they have been well grounded in the kinds of values that, and it doesn't really matter whether you're Catholic or whether you're Jewish or you're Muslim or you're Protestant, it's really what kind of person are you and what kind of contributions do you want to make to the world? So, I mean, when you say Catholic values, they're gospel values. They're values of compassion, values of kindness, values of concern for the other, you know, put somebody else ahead of you, put, put his concerns ahead of you. Um, you know, go the extra mile. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I mean, these are all things that we share as human beings. Mm -hmm. um, we, as Catholics, approach it specifically through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, other faith traditions approach the same values 
through their own particular lens. But I think as, as people who are you know, walking this journey on this planet together, you know, we have concern for each other. We have now concern for Mother Earth and are we destroying our, our homeland, mm -hmm. which is everybody's homeland. It doesn't matter whether you're an American or a Russian or you know, a, a Zimbabwean. Uh, we all own this, country, this, this land mm -hmm. and we all are obliged, really, to care for it tenderly mm -hmm. and to not make decisions that will cause it harm. I think that's something we've learned lately because I think here, especially in America, we had so much, you know, we, uh, we had so much water, we had so much everything, just wealth mm -hmm. and abundance that I think it's only been the last like 20 or 30 years that we've said, wait a minute, you know, we're polluting our streams, we're doing serious harm to our children, we're you know, lead poisoning and, and uh, you know, unsafe water in, in Appalachia and places where the coal slag has been allowed to go into the streams. All of these things that we never thought about, mm -hmm. now we're thinking about. And so I think as, uh, certainly as Catholics, but also all of us, as human beings, as human yeah. beings, mm -hmm. as human beings uh, you know, and, and we, we may approach it from, a, as I said, a particular focus or through a particular lens, mm -hmm. but it's, we're all about the same thing, I think, ultimately. I hope. Yeah. Yes. With all of that say, what do you wish for the future of St. Joseph's College? Oh, I wish it to endure, to prosper for another hundred years at least, and above all, I wish it to be faithful to its mission, which is to provide a high quality, affordable education for men and women who are eager to go from here to go out and change the world and make it a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You're welcome. Thank you, so and thank you all very much. Thank you.